Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a podcast to answer your questions on addiction, recovery, and mental health by Wiseman Method Opioid Treatment Specialists and Rapid Detox Center. We've been talking about the subject of overdose and with some of the issues of fentanyl coming into the United States, and we've got an interesting angle that's also very, very scary and very, very tragic to talk about that it's also very, very important. There has been such a big uptick in younger people getting involved uh, with this and seeing overdose even amongst kids in middle school. This is traditionally kids uh, age 10 to 14 here in the U.S., and uh, I don't I don't know the age breakdowns or what they call middle school in all other countries, but I know that in the U.S. we've seen increase, a huge increase, with uh, kids even that young who are getting into overdose deaths. David Livingston and I are going to be talking about this today. Clara, unfortunately, was not able to uh, join us today, but we're going to be uh, digging into this topic. And right as we were getting ready to record... Uh, David and I were just comparing notes. I would say your your considerable expertise on social media, uh, David. I, I, how would you? How did you describe that to me? <laughs> uh, my 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 considerable uh, expertise comes from everybody but myself uh, in terms of social media, uh, particularly uh, uh, my kids and family members. But but that said, um, you know, it's look, it's all just a form of communication and um, information. And, and I, I know enough to know how things work, um, <laughs> right. uh, um, but, but I'll leave it at that. An interesting thing to see how technology will facilitate these things, which it always has ever since we, I don't know, the first phone got plugged in. Uh, the first phone call was, of course, uh, what, what uh, Alexander Graham Bell or whoever. And then the second one was about people scheduling a drug deal. No, that's not probably true. That's not historically accurate, but... Um, the, you know, pretty soon things are used for things that people want to use them for. And so people who are trying to spread opiate use or who are trying to sell drugs, they're going to use what's available. And And there's quite a bit uh, going on with social media and how that's affecting. I, interestingly enough, I just barely had this conversation recently with my kids. Do you know the stuff that's going around? Do you know what fentanyl is? And do you know what this is? And that even if you were going to misbehave, so to speak, even if you were going to do something, uh, there are definitely more dangerous ways to do it and, uh, and, and not, and there are people dying. And having this conversation, which one of the interesting things to find out was that they really hadn't heard people talk about this, this overdose risk. You know, you don't hear kids talk about that as the way they talk about other risks and things. That's right. Uh, that's exactly right, which is why I would strongly suggest that parents scare their kids you know and because fentanyl is being put into all kinds of things not just opioids but other um, substances you know like benzodiazepines i've even heard of it being in marijuana and other things where it you know things are getting laced with it is i guess the terminology and so it's a scarier world i think in that regard than it's ever been when i was growing up if 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 you you know, it was a big deal for someone to go out and sort of smoke some pot or something or, but it wasn't, it wasn't dangerous and, and kids would explore a little bit and there were still boundaries. And, but now it's changed. I, I certainly am, you know, having that discussion with my kids so that they understand it's, it's scary in a way that it, it did not used to be. One of the triggers for this conversation uh, that we were looking at was an article that was, uh, it's titled Middle School Children Fall Prey to Fatal Fentanyl Overdoses by uh, Jen Christensen. And uh, Claire had shared that with us as we're, we're picking topics for this episode. Uh, the reason I want to mention the article is because a couple of uh, facts that come out of that that take the example of a young man who's age 14 actually came to his parents and said, I need some help. I've been fooling around with pills a little bit. I was curious about them. I started taking them. And uh, then soon after, like very soon after, he um, had told them, I believe it was even within uh, days of telling them, he died. He died of overdose. Another very interesting thing about this case is that he had done what I think a lot of young people now do when they are going to do something. He had actually researched on the Internet before messing around with pills or taking any drugs. And he had, he had looked up things like, well, here's how much you can do to avoid becoming dependent. 
here's you know don't do more than this in this amount of time and you'll be less risk for overdose and so i mean and and i'm not i'm not certainly trying to endorse <laughs> the trusting what you find there but you know that's a very interesting thing to me is to say that you know young people are used to looking up things and saying if i'm going to do something i want to i want to do it right i'll read the amazon reviews or whatever <laughs> whatever it is um but to say you know he was he was trying to be as safe as possible but what he didn't know was that a lot of the pills that are available especially on the street level are actually fentanyl that is you know used in a pill press or whatever and uh, uh, they said some of the statistics here are that uh, four out of 10 of the pills that you might buy on the street, they say four out of 10 fake pills made with fentanyl contain a potentially deadly dose. And that's according to the DEA and the, just the data that they've gotten. So that really only comes from the ones they've recovered, right? What they have access to. There's got to be more out there that they haven't seen. That's, that's 40% yeah. chance. You, you take something that you may, you might, I, I didn't know that statistic, but that's, that's, and, and not surprising. I, um, I mean, and you, t- I, you know, I'm talking with people who are detoxing and so forth, who've had, you know, you know, some have OD'd and come back. Many have lost friends to it. And um, so what happens is, is that, that the way people talk about it, you know, because stuff is, is, when, when things, uh, you know, and I think social media has sped this up, um, uh, you know, uh, where, where when you're talking and thinking about things, there's a comfortableness, there's an ease, there isn't a real sort of sense of, you know, this, you know, it's not like you feel like you're walking on, on, you know, an edge of a cliff, right? You feel relaxed and like, oh, this could be fun. You don't feel like there's a 40% chance I might fall off this cliff. Yeah. So I think that <laughs> I went hiking, right. went hiking right. uh, which is not like me, but I went hiking a few years ago with my son and this uh, uh, little scout group and thing that he was uh, a part of. And we went here in Utah where I live. We went down to Zions National Park and they have this uh, well-known thing called Angel's Landing where you get up to a certain point and you just have to hike with this cable and it's a very small trail and you get up thousands of feet in the air and it's kind of an accomplishment they have had people perish on that hike before, um, and they have the statistics somewhere available, and it's like, oh, you know, out of the millions of people who go up there every year, the last time was a long time ago, and the, all those things that help people feel better about doing it. If they had a sign there that said, four out of ten of the people that go up here are going to fall off, I, I don't think that it would be as popular of an, of an attraction. So, so parents and friends and other people need to scare each other. And because it because it's that dangerous, not because, you know, you, you want to, you know, be a, um, a pain, but because you want to be you want your friends and your family and the people you care about. And, and you know, in our society in general to stay intact and stay well, it, you, I'll hear about it. You know, you hear about it some. But when I start to see the statistics on 100,000 people overdosing last year. That it's it's unbelievable. So yeah, and and it's and the access and and because of social media, you know, I think um, information and accessibility is is happening at earlier and earlier ages. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the idea of being scared, being the right level of scared, I kind of wonder because my whole life I know that I've always heard people talk about drug use and drug abuse in those that terminology, life or death, life or death, life or death. You know, if you use drugs, you'll die. If you use drugs, you'll die. It'll ruin your life. It'll ruin your life. That kind of thing. I think because people have casual experiences with intoxicants all the time, you kind of get the other. On the other side, there's people that are like, oh, no, you're just a narc and it's it's fun and, you know, it'll it enhances your creativity or it enhances your, you know, it just makes life so much better on the other extreme. Even those of us that are in the treatment world I think we look at it and we say, well, we, we, we'll try to be honest and try to be realistic about this and say most, if many people have casual encounters with intoxication and it never messes up their life and they don't die from it and they don't have serious health problems from it. Now that there is this crisis, I, I, I worry that people are used to hearing like, oh, you know, take a drug, you'll die right away. And it's like, well, actually now, you know, they're, they're, that's more true than it's ever been, but people maybe 
don't listen to it as much <laughs> because it's like, oh, I've been saying that. I've always been saying that. If you're talking to a friend who says, I've been taking it for a year, I'm fine. It's fine. You know, it's good. You'll feel this. You'll feel that. You're, who are you going to believe? Right. Mm-hmm. You're, you know, your friend's there. He's doing fine. There is a difference between real if you're, If someone's getting opioids from a pharmacy, if they're really pharmaceutical uh, grade medications, that's different than it is if you're buying off the street. And you don't know half the time. I know people who have thought they were getting medications from pharmacies who that were not and it had fentanyl and and they were when they found out they were you know it's like oh my gosh i could have or i did overdose and they brought me back and then i found that out and so it's it's scarier because of that and um that didn't used to be the case to the degree it is now you know it's it like you're saying <laughs> it's it's uh, you know i think i've used this metaphor before but like if you tell everybody there's a a monster in in the forest, you know, over there, you know, everybody's head turns towards the forest and starts wondering how close they can get to the forest. (laughs) And then they want to go in the forest and then they want to see the monster. So it's like in scaring people, you also bring their attention to it to some degree. Um, But this is, this is, um, so any rate, I, it's, it's how, how do you scare people? You, you, you make them realize that you could take one pill and it could be your last. And so if you're going to do something, if you want to mess around with something, there are, you know, kids are going to experiment. The idea that they're not is just, I think, naive. Um, Some won't, but many, many will. So the question then is, how do you do it in a way that's not really dangerous. When fentanyl is laced into so many drugs, and I had heard the same thing you did just recently. I heard someone talking about uh, marijuana or some other or some dealers that are actually using those kinds of things to where someone may have every reason to think they're not going to be exposed to the fentanyl, and they are. Seems to be pretty important with all the overdose potential is the availability of naltrexone, and there are some states that are very regulated in it, and there's been some uh, appeal to the administration to uh, make it not just prescription only, to where people can have access to naltrexone and have it in the schools. You know, I I was talking to a neighbor of mine who's a librarian, actually, in a a library that's in an urban city area, and they actually keep an overdose box for people who go into overdose uh, if they are using, say, in the in the, the library bathrooms or something, and they've had to use that at times for people who are having overdose symptoms that might not last until the ambulance gets there. Um, right. So they, they use Narcan, which is basically, you know, a, a, a fast way. I believe it's naltrexone, right? So they, they yes. get an antagonist on board immediately. I, I'm curious your, your thoughts, though, about... What are some of the things that hold people back from wanting to, I don't know, take those precautions? Do people Are people hesitant to say, oh, I want that to be in my kid's school because I know my kid would never do it, so I don't think about it? Or is it just denial? I think it, in a way, it's too awful for parents to think about at times. And they also don't want to think that their kids could get involved in it. It's It's kind of scary. And it's it's not an easy thing to, it, 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 there's some balance there and it depends who you are as people. It's, it's very personal because I think you have to know kind of your kids and, and what's, you know, and, and how, how they're wired and, and what they're, they're going to get exposed to. From my perspective, you want to keep an open dialogue. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, it, and if they are going to experiment with, you know, alcohol at some point or marijuana or other things and which most people do. Okay. I I think most kids do not all kids, but a lot of kids do. You just want to make sure that there's an open dialogue, a lot of safety in terms of talking about it so that you can really, you know, hone in on what the dangers are and then educate them. But I I think the major, the, the main thing to be careful of these days is pills um, of all sorts, because you don't know what's in them. One of the things that I thought was, I think is the the most useful feedback I've ever gotten about having an open dialogue with your kids is making sure that when you do talk to them, how are you talking to them about things that aren't drugs, sex, 
and all the you know kinds of behavioral things that you might be worried about. When you're talking to your kids about normal things or about homework or any of those kinds of things, are you freaking out at them if they say something you don't like? Are you listening to them? Are you engaging in a dialogue? You know, when they have questions about things. Um, or they have opinions about things? Are you belittling them, or are you actually taking what they say seriously? There's a lot of elements to how we talk about things that aren't that important, that are the smaller subjects. And I think that's going to go into whether or not our kids are likely to say, hey, I'm thinking about uh, trying opiates, you know, because <laughs> if if you yelled at me about me having a weird opinion about something, or if you, uh, uh, you know, yelled and screamed when I brought home a certain kind of report card. I'm certainly not going to tell you that the other night I took a pill and I felt really funny, um, but I might want to do it again. Well, I, I, I think that's it. Like, and, and, you know, one of the things I say to people is, and I put it just like this, I say, listen, I don't give a damn about the chemicals. I, I, I care about you. I want you to be okay. So just talk to me about it. Right? Just tell me what's going on and so forth, and we'll figure it out. And so just to open it up and, and remove it from, you know, um, it's, it's, it's the same with, you know, whether you get a, 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 an A or a D, you know, I don't really care about the A or D. I do care about your development in your life and how you're, you know, and how things, right, or, and what's going on. And, and so the, the, the subject's bigger. It's, it's about really, you know, the progression and the development of a, of a person. And, that includes your how how you talk to each other, how you think about things together, how they you know internalize, you know, be, because the better they feel about themselves, the more valuable they feel. The chances are they'll make better decisions. I think so. What you're pointing out, I think, is is critical. What is so? If you're, I mean, is there a certain tone that you that when you're talking with your kids and so forth that that you have found effective? As I try to have the same message that you do a lot of time, which is like, look, you know, whatever it is, we'll figure it out. If there's something wrong, we'll figure it out. Um, let's just not, you know, let's not get into where you have to hide something from me because you think I'll be mad. But then when I'm using those words, it has to be backed up by whether or not I got mad over something stupid the day before. <laughs> right? That's that to me. That's the biggest thing that I try because it is sort of hard as a parent. You know, I'm I'm one of those parents. I tend to get more frustrated about stupid things like the trash can not getting taken out or or something like that than I am to get upset about grades. I feel like I and and, and so that's different. Like I might say, "Oh man, this trash can is you know over full. Why didn't someone just take it out?" Um, and in that case, I have to watch that that I'm not freaking out about little stupid things uh, because then how are you going to talk to me about something serious? One of the things that I think is a struggle in in talking to my kids is actually that they're good, smart kids. Now, that's funny because there's so many advantages to having a kid who's a good kid and a smart kid. Um, But it's also hard to talk to them because they really don't want to disappoint you, oftentimes, (laughs) if they're a good kid. And will be really hesitant to tell you, yeah, I'm really, I'm getting into a little bit of trouble with my grades, for example. Um, I've, you know, I've gotten overwhelmed. I'm taking too many classes. I'm no, they'll usually just try to fix it and then tell you later or hope you didn't notice. And their grades took a dive for a while. They'll just say, I'll just get ahead of it later and it'll be fine. And you're busy. And now you throw on top of that, if they're an emotionally sensitive kid. And I would say, I know that we stay away from generalities on this podcast, but I do find that those that are emotionally sensitive oftentimes, um, are, are a little more at risk to get into addiction in the first place? I mean, I think there's a lot of factors and that can be one, but, oh yeah. I mean, how, how a person is put together and, and people are put together very differently in terms of their, their sensitivity levels, their, their, you know, interests, you know, how, how their nervous system is, is wired and what they respond to. And, and I think you, you have to know, you, you know, as a, you know, if we're speaking about parents, you've got to know your kid and you have to know, like, there's some kids you can, you know, will come to you if there's an issue. There's other kids you'll never hear from if, there, if there's an issue and you have to, you have to pay attention. You've got to kind of check in. You got to, so you, above all else, 
you, you have to be attuned to who your kid is and how they operate and what the dynamics are. I mean, attunement is the thing, right? You, you stay attuned, right? You stay close, you stay attuned, you know, and, and we all miss things and we all, you know, but if there's a, if it's good enough, I think it's your best bet. But the other thing is the time, the, the amount of time you spend with someone will dictate a lot. So it's, you know, and, and also I know that, that the more time I spend talking with someone or with someone, the more things that move from the background to the foreground. The first inclination isn't going to be to want to tell you certain things, especially if they're hard things or hard discussions or they feel embarrassed or worried about your response or something like that. But the more time you're together, the better the chance those things that are in the background may come to the foreground. And plus, you also just the rapport and everything gets stronger. So I think time's critical. Sometimes the social media can actually give the illusion of safety because I don't have to go to a sketchy neighborhood to find something. Uh, I can find it online. And so it feels like I'm a lot safer. Uh, but in, 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 in reality, the secrecy of it going up is actually proportionately more dangerous nowadays. And if you're taking a pill, you don't really know what you're putting in your body. Unless you got it from a doctor and a pharmacy and it's been prescribed, you don't know what you're putting in your body. And, um, and you, you're not, it's, it's unclear what, what it could be. I, I, I just think that's the thing that everybody has to understand. And, um, um, and, and because, because there is so much uh, anonymity and, and the world is now so connected and, 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 and in some ways it's good in some ways it, it's not good at all. You just, you, you, you have to make sure that, that your, your kids and friends and everybody's aware of it. I've seen so much of, of the losses in people and lives and so forth. If you're going to, if you're going to make a mistake, make a mistake in going, going too far and scaring them better. They are a little more scared than a little too comfortable. You, you can help that by also helping them feel comfortable with you. And just reminding them that it's not the chemicals you're worried about, it's them, right? And But the chemicals right, are, are that dangerous. So it's like walking around a cliff that our instincts don't kick in. Something looks benign and safe, and but it's not. And that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for listening to myself. I'm Dwight Hurst and David Livingston as we've been able to have this conversation. We'd like you to get involved in the conversation. You can follow us on Twitter at opiates for the account for the Wiseman Detox and Opioid Treatment Specialists. Please participate in our hashtag, hashtag stop the silence to make sure that we are spreading awareness and sharing the word about the fentanyl crisis and of how out of hand and how scary that's becoming. Our messages on Twitter are open, and you can also email us at info at opiates.com to learn more or to share questions that you would like to see us address on this show. This show is produced by Pop Collar Productions, and our music is the song Medical by Clean Mind Sounds. Remember, until we meet again, keep asking questions. If you ask questions, you can find answers, and wherever you find answers, you can find hope. Thanks again for listening. Talk to you again soon.